Hello everyone. My name is Reese Lindmark and you are listening to The Reese Show. On the show, we're trying to clarify what a good future looks like. I know we're all a bit sad about late stage capitalism and we want to transition to something but we don't really know what's next. So, on the show, we interview experts about what is emerging, this beautiful future vision that we can all lean into. I hope it gives you a sense of purpose and clarity about the future. If you like the show, you know, feel free to do something about it. <laughs> you can leave us a five-star review. You can tell your friends. You can name your first child Reese. Whatever makes you happy. And if you really dig it, we have an online school called Root, where we help folks understand these root-level systems to find our route forward. We have cohorts of world-class systems thinkers that run every couple of months. So if you're interested in that, check us out at root.co. That's R-O-O-T-E dot co. Thanks. Today I chat with Sarah Drinkwater, who is a leader of the responsible tech movement at Omidyar Network. And it's a great convo. We chat about a lot of different things, uh, especially language, a lot on language, a lot on bottom-up you know, movement building, her experience in angel investing versus non-angel investing, et cetera, et cetera. So I hope you enjoy today's convo. Bye. Hello, listeners. Today, I'm excited to chat with Sarah Drinkwater. Sarah is the director of Responsible Technology at Omidyar Network and has supported an amazing variety of great projects in this space. Sarah, thanks for being on the show and welcome. Thanks for having me, Reese. Yeah, excited to dive in. And yeah, beforehand, Sarah and I were just talking about like, I'm just I'm just hyped about all of the Sarah's work and Sarah and, and the Omidyar network in general. They support just a lot of great projects that I'm into. Um, and so I kind of just want to dive in on that, understand how Sarah, you know, thinks about these projects and then also later chat about the kind of nonprofit versus for profit space. Um, so to start, though, Sarah, I guess, how do you think about. Um, you know, your, what's your theory of change here in building a responsible tech movement? Like, how do you find these great projects and how, what do you think about, you know, what's your one year, five year vision here? Well, first, thank you for saying that. Like, I, I still feel like our work in this space is pretty new um, and the scope feels enormous. So I really appreciate you liking our work so far. Um, you know, we spent over a decade as a major network impact investing from sort of the early noughties um, in sort of very delineated areas like uh, civic tech, financial inclusion, um, uh, education. And, you know, particularly post 2016, post the election, I think had a kind of aha moment around, okay, investing a discrete for profit, nonprofit companies alone isn't enough, we have to kind of go a bit upstream. Um, And particularly in technology, I think for me, I came to Imagear in 2018 to kind of start this team and kind of grow it. I've been in technology for kind of a long time, and I've been observing a lot of challenges. I think firstly, for me being not American, this challenge around the Silicon Valley growth narrative for better or for worse I kept seeing um, get in the way of founders in Europe where I'm from. And so a lot of our work in this space began from the the point of view of, okay, um, how do we help tech stick to the promise it originally gave us? Like I do this work because I like technology and I care about technology. And I think it, it, you know, it does bring us even now when it's so complicated, incredible convenience, incredible connection at the same time, you know, where we've come to with the notion of a responsible tech movement. When we started this work, we thought, okay, if you want better products that have, Um, better outcomes for more people. You talk to five people at the top of those companies and that's what makes change. And that was March of our 2018. And I think we learned a lot in that year. You know, I think first of all, we learned that um, even if you got in the room with these people, they were so bound up in um, the structures they work in, you know, the the boards they had to answer to, um, the up and to the right kind of hockey stick growth that it was, it was very hard to make real change happen. At the same time, there were all these really interesting trends. You know, for me, um, having been an executive at Google, I was kind of in the middle of the company, right? You had the kind of SVPs over in California making up all the rules. Um, you had many people, um, you know, the the canteen workers, the security guards, content moderators kind of building the company. And I was somewhere in the middle. And what's been interesting to us is observing that a lot of the change that we seek, we think is going to come from a lot of this middle. You know, these are the people that have the skills to build technology companies. These are the people that have really been looking around, certainly in the last year and realizing, wow, what I'm doing now isn't enough. And whether these people are inside of big tech companies pushing from within, whether they're outside building very new kinds of companies with different revenue models, you know, that's that's been kind of part of our theory of change is that you know, to shift the industry, you need to shift the people who we center. And the people that we center, we believe are currently kind of in the middle. 
But to be honest, it's still very early days. You know, I think tech worker organizing is a space that we were very excited. You know, I think that was a trend that we observed in 2018 that's kind of been going incredibly well with like Medium's news last night. That feels like an incredibly fruitful area. But at the same time, the space is very new. It feels like a lot of actors are coming together at the same time, whether they're technologists, academics, activists, policymakers. You know, a lot of people are kind of pushing for change in the industry in different aspects. And we hope to kind of fund and support many of those players. Um, But when you talk about where we find projects, you know, to me, this is kind of interesting because, you know, I really want to be very transparent in this in this podcast. Like we are very open to to proposals to being pitched on Twitter, Mm -hmm. wherever people can get hold of us. You know, my email is sdrinkwater at amidyard.com. But places that have worked for us, you know, we tend to kind of track what's happening. So for example, Ethical Source is a, a recent investee of ours. I read about them. Um, my brother, like two of my brothers and my dad are all open source developers. And, it's you know, one of them, <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny because I'm the least technical person in the family. Um, and one of them texted me last year saying, hey, have a look at this. And it was an article in a, a very technical magazine about uh, Coraline and her team's work. And I thought, wow, this is cool. Um, began following her on Twitter. We began emailing. And it was just the kind of thing where as they were pivoting from being a volunteer-led organization into an institution that was seeking their first funding, we happened to be tracking them at the right time. Um, but other times we kind of have to really hunt for things or, you know, we have in the past kind of come up with an idea and partner with somebody to kind of make it happen. But um, we are always open to kind of new proposals and always open to new projects. Yeah, cool. I think, and we'll kind of dive into some of those areas that you're looking into in a quick sec. I think, so it sounds like, as you said, like at the beginning, y'all were like, oh, sweet, let's like chat with the people with the most power. Um, And then, (laughs) which makes sense. So bad thinking back. No, but we we had some really old fashioned assumptions that I think we had to unlearn, you know? Yes, no, totally. And I think it's kind of, it's connected to our like networked reality where it's like, oh, like maybe back in the day, if you were trying to change a railroad company, um, it was easy. You maybe had to go from the top, you know, or you could go down, down, down with like the big unions or whatever. But now there's this kind of new middle uh, area that you're talking about where the folks who can build companies, like the, the power of the internet to, um, you know, like Clubhouse or whatever has 10 employees and, you know, 4 million people on the platform, you know, Instagram had 13 employees. Yeah. And so it's like, you can have that too with uh, responsible tech folks, or it's like the amount of reach that you can have with a small crew is really powerful. Well, and I think that's that's what can be very hard to understand for kind of the sort of institutional gatekeepers of the kind of old world order, right? Like you look at, you look at why, you know, certain policy teams have had such a hard time getting their hands around technology and it's because it's transnational. You know, like um, my friend was on the founding team of Instagram and when they got bought, again, it was 10 people being sold for this incredible amount of money. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's it's kind of so hard to, to understand that, you know, if you think about the Alphabet Workers Union that went live last month, the, the initial group that went live with that was comparatively small. It was 100 or so, you know, I think it was a couple of hundred people in an organization of 200,000 employees. But I think it's... um. It's really about bringing people together and helping them understand their common goals. And, you know, this is something that we feel, you know, I think there's a couple of common challenges in this space. One is that the definition itself of responsible tech, it's it's so Mm. subjective and so personal. And I think, like, I have a very particular, I have definitions that I would ascribe to it that might be different from yours, Reese, and and both are equally valid. And I think it's, I think it's about creating language that galvanizes and brings people together while at the same time not you know if you look at tech for good and how that got kind of captured by other people while creating space for kind of other perspectives to kind of come in um and i think secondly there's you know something we've observed is that this space is still quite new you know if you look at um the first grant that we ever made center for humane tech you know they're still even three years in a comparatively small organization with incredible impact but still comparatively small in terms of people so you know, something that I'm really passionate about is how do we create community layers or places that bring different organizations together to help them all kind of organize, have more impact, you know, especially in small companies, it's exhausting being a founder, right? That, you know, it's incredibly tiring. And I I worry about our founders burning out the whole time. Yeah, totally. I think that that's a powerful, that's an interesting piece when you're like trying to build a movement. And this is something that, yeah, it's like, you're trying to both invest in specific companies, but you're also, or not invest, but, but, you know, give grants yeah, to specific companies. Um, yeah. yeah. Fund. And you're also trying to 
kind of create, like kickstart the like category itself, you know? And so like, how do you think about, cause like, there's a funny thing within like, you know, traditional VC investing, which is like, okay, um, I am Andreessen Horowitz and I want to invest in Clubhouse and it's a zero sum game, me versus the other um, venture capitalist who's trying to get in on that versus y'all where it's like, if somebody else, like the Ford Foundation or whatever, um, gives money, yeah, to, exactly, <laughs> gives money to public infrastructure, like you're happy about it. So how do you, how do you think about that? And how does that change your mindset around like building the movement itself? Oh, I so prefer it. I mean, I think, um, you know, as, as you know, my background has very much been in building community products, right? I'm a long term community person. And I just prefer collaborative approaches. You know, I think with us, something I'm most proud of in the last couple of years is how many other funders we've been able to bring with us on the journey. You know, um, we are so small compared to other like, so say, for example, like a Ford or a Rockefeller, you know, these are far, you know, they have a lot more heritage than us, they have a lot more money than us. Um, and they have very fully formed theories of change. So I think, I think the fact that we now have co-funding in place with a lot of these organizations where, you know, we've been able to kind of test out funding a certain organization that then has become big enough and and sort of substantial enough for them to come in on the next round as such, not that rounds really exist in this world, <laughs> to me is kind of amazing. And I think actually, I you know, there's a couple of new, you know, even this year you're seeing Mindaroo and Archerwell begin to take strides in this space, which to me is very exciting. I think it's a very big, big problem. So we need as much money as possible behind it. Yeah. What were those two places that you said who are in now? So Mindaru has just joined. Uh, it's just, yep. so Mindaru is an Australian-based foundation that's just begun funding in this space. And Archerwell is the Duke and Duchess of Sussex's foundation that also has just begun um, funding in this space too. Cool. Yeah. I, uh, today I learned that it's uh, Mindaru, not Mindaru. Is that right? Oh, oh, okay. I'm mispronouncing it in that case. Mindaru. Okay. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying I think you probably have it correct. Um, I don't in know. My, uh, <laughs> It's Maybe been, we're both it's incorrect. And it, you know, I think it's um I think it's pretty interesting. Like there used to be, you know, you have you have phases of, of philanthropy, right? And I think there definitely was a phase where it was like solve every problem with an app. And that mm -hmm. feels very archaic now. And I think then we had the kind of narrative phase where it was like solve everything with a narrative campaign. And I hope now we're in a space where it's far more about, okay, how do we fund um communities and coalitions and kind of get out of the way? You know, like I've I've really observed us shift from you know, early on when I when I first started, a lot of the grants we did were project based. You know, you funded someone to do a certain thing. Whereas because our organizations are so small and so early, my preference really is for kind of core funding where, you know, you fund the organization to be who they are. Um, and I think particularly in a COVID, you know, in this world that we're in, the idea of projects going entirely according to plan is a bit funny and not possible, I think. Yeah, totally. I think, well, one thing I want to double check on here, which is, is there a, so in theory, so something I, you know, often talk about on the podcast, like, oh, I'm a very, you know, like a do-gooder kind of person, but it's also like, like anti-competition. And at the same time, what you're talking about with like, between like doing co-funding, you know, collaborating with other funders or whatever, is there also though, like, what like competition kind of must show up in some aspects there is it in terms of like status or is it in terms of are you still competing over funding different projects or like how does does it show up it actually it actually doesn't in the way that you might think fun i mean maybe i'm just you know i'm new to this space and i'm probably hopelessly naive mm -hmm. but i think um so far what i've observed and i should note that i'm sure this is not maybe this is a a contrarian point of view. I don't see that competition. It could be because my area is so new. Like I'm sure if you work in disinformation, for example, or, or responsible mm -hmm. AI, it's a, it's a far more built out area where I'm guess, I guess there is more jostling for position, but we have the incredible luxury of helping a space kind of take, sh take shape. And, and to me, you know, we're at the nice stage where the more collaborators, the better, right? I can't imagine a time when I'd be like, okay, the money is done. We have enough of it. Please go away. That would be <laughs> A literal dream situation, I think, for anybody who cares about this problem. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I guess I'll be curious to see in if you're continuing to be successful in one, three, or five years, if the space continues to get bigger, if um, it turns into something, you know, more crowded space, kind of like disinfo or whatever, where oh, it's yeah. more. Yeah, so that'll be, I'll be curious to see that. The other question I guess I have here is like, to kind of dive in, I'm probably... I think both you and I have some of the like, oh, Silicon Valley growth, tech is good side, but also yeah. a lot of oh, the yeah. like, oh, oh God, like this is like, Definitely. we got to make sure like things are. 
So like, how do you think one thing that's in this space, like, and for me coming from like the crypto world, like more libertarian um, and like seeing, so like unions, let's chat about unions. Oh yeah. <laughs> how should I, cause like I'm, I love the idea of like decentralized ownership, decentralized yeah. uh, governance. That's all great. And also I see some of the downsides of unions. Like in America, we have like these teachers unions who are very, again, it's like they don't yeah. have plans yet. So um, in any case, how like, so I want these unions to be amazing and beautiful. And how are you, yeah, what does that look like right now? What do these tech unions look like? And why should I be a libertarian excited by them? Yeah. Well, look, I think um, something that always attracted me to tech was the the beautiful diversity of it, right? The freedom of it. The fact that, the, the fact that um, you could talk about anything. Like, I think, I think for me, having come from journalism that was very constrained by structure, you know, certainly in the noughties, I liked the internet and nobody else there did. Um, and it very much was like, if you had an idea for a feature, you had to go to your boss's boss and pitch it. You know, it was very different to, you know, for me, when I first came into startups, the idea that I could just go and do a thing was incredible. Um, and I think, I think probably for my younger friends who work in tech, that's really hard to understand that like, it's not a given that you get to do what you want the whole time in other industries. Yeah. I think, um, I think with unions, what's interesting is as you look at the massive tech companies, and I, I think they have a particular use case in the mega, mega tech companies, right? I think if you're a tiny company, you, you, you know, there are more opportunities to kind of create the culture as you go. You know, when I first joined Google in London, there were a couple of hundred of us. It was a really small team and they were mostly engineers. Um, and it was very, it was a very free space, right? Like we talked about a lot of things. My work was, re- you know, my work has always been really important to me. You know, it, it just felt, it felt like we all had, we had a lot of openness around what we could discuss, but at the same time, there were certain th- certain things many of us held dear. Like nearly all of us were left in terms of our politics, for example, um, different shades of left. And I think what's really interesting is as these companies have got larger, um, you know, you've naturally had these massive, you know, it, it's very different going from a 300 person organization to being a sort of multi hundred thousand person organization, right? Um, you know, it's harder to find out information internally. It's harder to find out, you know, you, you read in the press what your company's doing. And I think what's really interesting is particularly in Google, where you have this long term culture of dissent, this long term culture of like speaking up, which, I, you know, I have my brothers at Amazon. I have got close friends at all the tech companies. I still observe that Google has the most free thinking culture in that way. I think what's interesting is over time, there's been this, this kind of cultural chasm between what the workers are talking about and what the execs are thinking. And you have such a structure where, you know, your, your manager, 10 people up decides a thing that's that has complete significance for your entire organization you know and i think i think that becomes really untenable after a while so i think what's interesting about unions is it's a way to kind of build community and build muscle at the kind of worker level at the very you know at the junior level because i think once you become a manager it's very hard to be involved with unions because you get a bit caught between who's your actual you know who you're actually most responsible to um i think what's interesting is looking at medium you know their union announced yesterday is union um, organizing in tech is comparatively new and organizing is messy personal business. It takes time and care. Um, and something that I think is interesting is in the tech world in general, we're used to things being quite fast. You know, um, we're very used to um, you start a thing, you try a thing, it doesn't work out, you close it. And organizing is very different in that it's very much about consensus. It's very consensus driven. Um, and I think there's a myth in some ways that tech teams are consensus driven, but they're kind of not. They normally have some kind of process that that where, th- where decisions get made, but it's not entirely, it's not egalitarian in the way that organizing is. So I think it's a, I think it's a really interesting trend. I think it's a way for workers to clearly express what they do and don't like and want, you know, and then managers can choose whether they care about that or not. And I think what's interesting is, you know, I see if you look at regulation, for example, it's very clear that tech regulation is coming. Um, you'd have to be a fool not to kind of see that. That's kind of a risk to these companies. But at the same time, what they care about more is talent risk. You know, hiring engineers, as you know, is very expensive. So I think there's I think there's a really interesting leverage point around if you're an individual, how do you get heard? If you're an exec, how do you dis- like how do you, you know, the the execs that decide to listen to their workers are signaling a certain thing to people they want to hire. The execs that want to listen to their shareholders are signaling a different thing. And, you know, what I care about is how do we have companies that are doing the right thing? And if they don't want to do the right thing, that's cool. There's, you know, they're going to do that, but ultimately there'll be some accountability for that. Right. So I think, I think unionizing as a whole is a really interesting trend. And I'm also curious, like a year ago, if you'd have said to me this time next year, there'll be three or four recognized unions in household name tech companies, I'd have been like, no way. So I think there's, I think the, the, the change of that has been incredible. 
But I also think as well, like to your point around libertarianism, there are always going to be certain people that a union is not the right place for, right? There are always going to be certain people that don't want to be in this collective approach. And I think I think we have to respect individual choice, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, if you if you want that, you can go work at Coinbase. You know, the apolitical. No. Um, <laughs> well, this is the thing, right? so, but Coinbase, you know, the Coinbase example is hilarious for lots of reasons, right? Um, first of all, because of the incredible luxury of of thinking that that financial systems are not political, but also, you know, Brian did a great thing in lots of ways. He told his employees who he was, yeah. and then they can make the choice, and that's up to them, right? And I think, I think we need more transparency like that, to be honest, because, you know, he will attract a certain kind of worker. Um, and that's complicated, of course, but at the same time, I'd rather that happens than somebody goes there who actually finds out it's not a good fit and then leaves and it's, you know, that's more messy, I think. Totally, totally. Yeah, I think it's a, um, at, at the bottom level, you want to have uh, kind of, it's okay to have lots of different, at the micro scale to have, you know, one group is libertarian and another group is um, more consensus driven or whatever. Like that's okay. Like homogeneity within the subgroups at the micro level produces like heterogeneity at the macro level, which is good. Um, yeah. I think that seeing both of those is, is nice. I also think I agree with what you said around, I mean, the regulation risk versus talent risk. And I think that the talent risk for these folks is like, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, you noted earlier about like the sense, the striving for meaning. It's like, okay, you can either go to like some of my friends in the Bay, like they work at Google and they make like $500,000. It's just like, oh my God, you're like 28. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah it's crazy, isn't it? But I think it's, I think it's interesting like that, that you know, it's, it's really hard for me to extrapolate between my own personal experience and the experiences of friends and what's happening more broadly. But, you know, you look at the last year and I think we've gone through so many crises and I think we've observed looking at kind of our community and surveys that we've done that for for some workers in tech that's really pushed them towards okay i need to have more meaning in my life if i've only got a limited time on this earth what does that meaning look like for me and that's a very individual choice and then of course other workers have been like okay got to earn this dollar got to lock it down and i i totally respect either choice i think people you know we're living in capitalism you have to do what makes sense for you and your family and your individual circumstance right yeah, totally. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think that there's a uh, yeah, different strokes for different folks. But overall, the movement towards uh, unions and decentralized, bo- uh, yeah, uh, decentralized ownership and or governance is a, is a good part. Do you know, by the way, like the decentralized um, unions have some aspects of decentralized uh, governance, aka like, let's listen to the workers here. Do they have and I know like employee stock ownership plans, like at Google, like uh, some of the employees have ownership but obviously a lot of it is still at the top or within you yeah. know, wall street or whatever is there is there a movement within um tech unions or tech organizing to like get ownership distributed better as well yeah they've been, they've been i mean it's very early right i think i think even awu is still are, are still kind of designing their biggest asks i think what's interesting about you know i'm particularly interested in kind of new forms of governance like the cooperative models that we're seeing in the startup landscape to me are, are kind of really exciting I think, um, you know, if you look at Twitter, for example, like they're incredible. In the last year, all of a sudden, they finally got their act together and they're doing loads of really interesting product innovation. Yeah. Um, you know, like spaces and fleets and, and bird watch. And you can tie that back very clearly to an activist investor that bought stock last June and basically forced them into, you know, I, I don't know if you remember this recent at the time, but basically they tried to get rid of Jack Dorsey. And I have to assume that some kind of bargain was made whereby Twitter finally committed to actually making product change. So I think um, I think activist investment, whether at, at small or large scale, can really make changes to companies. And I think also what's interesting is, you know, I am interested in decentralized, you know, when, when sort of blockchain as a concept was kind of first coming out, I was so excited by it. I think what's been really complicated about that is, is you know, at the time I was running a space for entrepreneurs in London where we had a, a huge volume of events, you know, we'd have like four things every single night. And it was naturally a home for a lot of the early community around blockchain and Bitcoin and, and the various um, the various kind of early products that kind of came out at the time. And what was interesting is the community that seemed to come around that notion of, of, of particularly Bitcoin were a very particular community, yeah. um, you know, very young dudes, um, <laughs> And it kind of pushed out a lot of other people that also were interested in the space. Yep. And so I think I have not kind of come to any, like I've been quite interested in crypto art recently and, and what that looks like, for example, like with Zora launching. But, um, I, you know, I think there's a lot of interesting cool stuff to test there. I worry that people who have not previously been involved um, in anything around the blockchain kind of look at it and think, oh, it's it's not for me because of X, Y, Z, you know? So I, f- I feel like there's almost a marketing job to be done. And okay, the potential of these protocols is this. 
how do we invite in very different kinds of perspectives? And I don't know how you go about that. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah, I think that the yeah crypto libertarianism and and the Bitcoin, yeah. especially the version of it of with early Bitcoin, it's like and um yeah, I mean it's uh yeah there are um it's, I think there's some ex- explorations there like you know Ethereum is kind of a pushback against that. It's like oh unicorns yeah. and all this like crazy stuff. So yeah, we'll see what happens there. So I have, I have a question though, kind of switching gears here around you know for you. Um, uh, what in your mind are your kind of like requests for projects in this space, you know, yeah. requests for, for startups kind of thing? Oh, I mean, I want to keep it really broad because I don't want to put off anybody listening who's not doing something that we would love. I mean, I think um, I am always interested in, you know, I think particularly, as I said earlier, around like language, you know, like right now, what does responsible tech mean? Um, I think I think experiments around language are kind of really interesting to me. I think tools are always useful. Like, for example, you know, Ethical Explorer, which came out last year, that was a, a sort of toolkit to help um, product managers, designers, et cetera, find their way into conversations around topics like power and AI bias. And the main reason that we made that ourselves is we kind of went looking for similar kinds of things and, and didn't really find, you know, a lot of the models that we found were, had a different focus. So I think um, resources and tools for sort of um, people in these roles at companies, how do you operationalize this work is a kind of core problem, I think. Um, I think communities that bring together those that care about this work are always going to be interesting to us. You know, we funded Logic School and um, a spin out from Stanford in the last year, both of whom are running evening classes that, you know, people who work in tech can kind of come and educate themselves, but also meet other people who care about the same topics as them. Um, you know, we we funded that as a way of building more kind of community in the space. Um, and I think also, particularly on the entrepreneur side, we haven't really done enough so far with startup founders. That's something that is a really strong passion of mine. Um, my principal, Ania Williams, who joined in the autumn, is the co-founder of Zebras Unite, who are ex-grantees of ours. You know, she's uh, sort of very well known in the startup scene. And I think with her joining, there's a very strong opportunity for us to be thinking about, OK, if you're a founder starting now, you know, uh, what are the programs that are useful to you? Um, in a world where there are 3,000 accelerator programs and most don't have that much value, you know, what do you need when you're kind of starting out to reimagine things? Um, and also something else that we've never quite cracked, like we're quite interested in alternative business models. You know, if you look at um, all these theories that this is the year that ad tech will finally collapse, that, that the advertising model of the internet will finally collapse, um, how do we monetize? How do we monetize what we do online? Um, we are super interested in ideas in that space. Uh, we spent quite a long time in 2019 looking into it and it felt a bit early, but I think the time is different now. Yeah, cool. So yeah, I'm hearing there's, you know, the language experiments, which are, that's like a great example too. Like experiments around language is something where it's like, it's hard for a startup to monetize that or for an angel investor to kind of invest in that. Yeah. But y'all can actually be like, look, we're trying to actively change the meme sphere here. And so we're trying to change yeah. language. How do you think yeah, about- a good, a good example. A good example in that space, just because that sounds a bit vague, now I hear it back, um, is New Public. <laughs> you know, this is, New Public is um, Eli Parisa and Talia Stroud. You know, they began doing research two years ago around what makes digitally healthy public spaces. You know, their theory was always that places like Twitter are like a modern version of a library. You know, that's a place where you can be in public for free. Um, you know, you would never expect to see somebody in the library give a Nazi salute because they'd be kicked out. Um, and so they spent two years doing research and kind of talking to a lot of people, but really, when they launched their work with a festival in January, they brought together this amazing community of kind of entrepreneurs, urbanists, big tech people, academics. Um, and what they were trying to do really was to argue for, you know, the need for digitally healthy public spaces, whether these places are owned by, you know, a lot of their thinking was around all through history, whether it's been the Acropolis in Athens, London coffee houses, places that have been used for kind of public conversation have always been owned by private companies. That's not a new thing. We shouldn't think of that as a new thing. But their research was really designed to kind of help both those in large social companies and those who are building new ones kind of do it better. So that's an example of, of both language, but also tools that I think has been really successful so far. Totally. Yeah. And I think that they're a great example of, it's a very, very simple metaphor where you're just like, okay, let's think about our, you know, digital spaces as parks or as public libraries. Like what would that mean? And just by that really simple switch, you're like, oh crap, like Facebook doesn't look like that. Like it could have a bunch of other more positive things like a library. So I think, yeah. Are there other experiments like language? um, I'm, I'm personally just very interested in language. Are there other aspects of language that interest you? I mean, I think um, another good example when I think about it is Zebras Unite. 
And I have to mm. find lots of zebras, right? For me, that's a really <laughs> hard thing. You know, they they created this identity that was very powerful that basically said, you know, we think of entrepreneurs, you know, the entrepreneur goal is to be a unicorn, but actually unicorns aren't real. Zebras are. They're black and white at the same time. They make money and do good. I think that's a narrative shift that also has an identity behind it that people want to follow and be part of. And I think that's very compelling. Um, I guess when I think about language, it's more, you know, I don't think somebody's going to emerge tomorrow and say responsible tech is this, but how do we create the mechanisms to bring a broad group together to come to some kind of definition? Um, I think the groups that the groups that were always inspired by, you know, if you look at the kind of um, the environmental scene, everything changed when the notion of climate change emerged, you know, it brought together loads of previous ills under one easily graspable name. And that happened because a couple of organizations got together and said, okay, we're not cutting through. How do we how do we convey the harm that we're seeing to the general public? And they came up with this term. Um, you know, now there's a shift towards climate emergency instead, which feels more appropriate for kind of where we are now, you know? Yeah. So I think, I think narrative is, to your point, it's really hard to fund. It often sounds super wacky, but I think it's actually quite important. You know, you look at time well spent and the change that shift has made in our heads, the idea of that being a valuable thing how, who doesn't want to spend their time well? To me, that's the most basic thing in the world. Totally, totally. Yeah, I think that, and I think it's a lot of this, The it's, yeah, it's like metaphors. And I think that the um, the zebras one is a great example. Yeah, they're just, they're very simple kind of turns that, that allow you to kind of um, flip over the like, oh, I've been thinking like a hyper growth mindset this whole time. Let's think in this other way. So yeah, I think that there's yeah. a lot of good experimentation to happen there. I guess the other thing I want to kind of double click on is, uh, the alternative business models. That one's a yeah. tough one because it is like, oh God. And it's at the root of your initial issue when you went to these, you know, the folks at the top of these tech companies and you're like, yo, Zuck, like, you know, can't you just like let's make less money? <laughs> and he was like, nah. Um, He's like, so, no, thank you. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So how do you, I guess like, yeah, how do you think about a nonprofit or like, yeah, what, what, what well, I don't think it's non- yeah. I mean, look, you know, we're lucky in that we're very flexible with our funding so we can fund for profit work. Right. Let's be clear. Um, we don't do it. Like I haven't done it very often at ON so far because so much of what I funded has been nonprofit, but I think, um, I think what I'm excited by is, you know, if you look at like Mozilla had this program builders last year, that was kind of cool. And it basically was like a mini accelerator. Like if you think about Mozilla, we think of them as being about the better internet, right? That's kind of what they're known for. And this program was basically an accelerator that took through 20 companies who were really early. And these companies were everything from like block party who do sort of um, harassment tools for Twitter to a lot of decentralized work around, okay, um, how could you do micro payments for content? You know, as an ex-journalist, I'm kind of curious about models for news particularly. And I just think, um, you know, I don't think, I don't think we're searching for like one startup that is fixing it all. I think it's more about how do we how do we help 20 or 30 founders get free to spend time thinking about this, right? And testing out new solutions. I don't think one solution is ever going to fix anything, but I think it's about how do we how do we open the minds? Like I'm, you know, particularly with my angel investing hat on, it's so interesting how few companies I see in the B2C space who have any kind of business model because they've been taught collect the data and then sell the data. And that's really challenging, right? Because first of all, we're in a different era now to Facebook's early days. Data is fragmented. The the routers that are making money is harder than ever, which means you're probably doing worse and worse things to make money. Um, and at the same time, it kind of limits your imagination. Like I I think I think back to like really simple insights, like when Bezos started Amazon, for all of the complexity of Amazon and the terrible things they've done, let's put that to one side for a second. His insight was, um, I want to start e-commerce on the internet. What is a thing I can sell? where you are never going to work into, walk into a shop and see everything you need. Books. Um, I'm a big book lover. That is very straightforward. I'm never going to walk into a bookshop and find the variety I have on Amazon. At the same time, I'm never going to go to Amazon and have the same kind of experience. I am going to an amazing local bookshop where they're going to know me. They're going to recommend things. You know what I mean? So I think, I think it's about when you have such dominant companies like the Facebooks and Googles and Amazons now, it kind of kills our imagination. And I really want to help founders to kind of get free of that and think, okay, if I had a blank page now, what would I do? How would I design my company? Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I think that there's there's the kind of, and that's to some extent back to the language piece where it's like these people, they just have a mind virus of like, no, you will have to, you're B2C, you just have to get hyper growth and make as much money as you can out of um, yeah, data long term once you get hundreds of millions of users. It's like, what are other ways to get value from folks? I yeah. think 
Yeah. So that makes sense. How do you, I mean, so in general, you're also a, in addition to your work at Omidyar Network, you also do angel investing. How do you yeah. think about the difference between grant making versus angel investing? What has it been like for you? I mean, to be honest, I'm really new in both, right? Like I've been, I've been grant making for two and a half years. I've been angel investing for about the same period of time. Um, I think, you know, I think they have different, you know, if I think about angel investing, you know, in my last life, I was working with early stage founders the whole time. You know, that was my day to day, my bread and butter. Um, and it struck me that as an angel investor, you know, if we're talking about going back to the last question you asked me around um, alternative business models, mm. the early stage of a company is when you're most able to have flexibility, right? That's when you can really experiment. That's when you can test how you make money. And a lot of the values and principles you set in stone there will stick with you as you grow. And that's why I was so excited to kind of think, okay, how could I help that founder at that stage? How could I learn from them? How could that work influence my day job? Um, and I'm very lucky that Amidjar gave me their blessing. You know, I've been working with Atomico, this amazing, very well-known European um, investor who gave me this incredible gift of basically $100,000 of free money to go out and find companies with. And it was interesting because I think, you know, Everything you're saying nest, yes to means saying no to something else, right? So you have to be very thoughtful about who you're funding and why. Um, I guess the difference with grant making is, you know, in both cases, there's a complicated power structure, right? You know, you are the person with the, mon the money, you're kind of holding the purse strings. I think in the, in the angel investing scene, it's a bit more equal because, you know, they're building a thing, you're backing it, you're owning part of it, your success is their success. The same in grant making in lots of ways, but at the same time, I'm really aware of the complications of, of how how little funding there is in this space, um, you know, and a lot of the companies that we fund are two or three people. They're very small, um, you know, margins are tight. They're going through COVID. I think there's, I think there's a lot of, a lot of um, privilege in the grant making world that I want to be very thoughtful about. And, um, you know, we as a mid-judge uh, try to be very intentional about how we act and behave and always on a journey of kind of improving our transparency, um, you know, learning in public, et cetera. Yeah. Interesting. So it's like a, well, that's, yeah, I mean, trying to think about, hey, the 100K gift is nice. You're like, oh, here's $100,000. And you're it's like, amazing, I will not right? put this in my pocket, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, um, I think it's a little bit like scout programs are so new in Europe. Um, it's been pretty amazing watching the scout program as a notion take take seed in Europe. That's kind of cool to see. That is cool. Yeah. Because, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great... It's a great thing to have just like, I mean, it's a classic part of like the ecosystem when you think about like the venture capital ecosystem and how much, um, how it has, it's, it's a very powerful one because you get these huge winners uh, back in the 90s and 80s and now the 2000s and Google and Facebook and whatever. And then those people, the company, the employees at these companies become angel investors. And then um, you just get a very robust ecosystem of people who can fund new experiments. Um, and so yeah, I think that- Yeah, that's what I think Europe is still missing is like, you know, we haven't had enough you know, we've had a couple of significant exits, right? But at the same time, you know, technology in London is not the same as San Francisco, right? We're still working on getting enough operators. And also like everyday investing, I actually wrote a piece about this because I was thinking about it so much, like having lived in Silicon Valley, like, um, you know, so many friends of mine in the US, like I can't think of a single friend in the US who doesn't have stocks and shares. Like it's very commonplace. Mm. Different in Europe, we don't do that. That's My parents don't have that at all. Um, the education around investing is at a very different stage. I think there's a lot more. There's a lot more room there to grow. That's funny. I didn't. I didn't know that. What do? You, do what do your parents have? Like bonds or something? <laughs> no, they just put money in savings accounts. Like it, it's. It's just. It's a very different. Um, you know, people have. You know, remembering that the UK has like a state pension and that healthcare is free. It's just different, right? So I think um, there's pros and cons to that. And I think particularly with startup investment, it means that angel investors tend to be either family money or the very small amount of serial entrepreneurs that have been through the loop and can put that money back in the system. So I think I think part of the reason why I'm so excited about the scout programs is, you know, my theory is if you change who's doing the angel investing, you change who gets money and you change the outcomes for everybody. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, I, I think that that's cool. And I think, yeah, it just makes me think about the kind of, I think the venture capital ecosystem has a very kind of powerful um, feedback loops and bottom upness with angel. And I'm thinking about like similar things within the responsible tech ecosystem and, and like yeah. nonprofits generally. And I don't, it, the tough thing with that is that like the, it, the venture capital one is just funded because these companies, you know, quote unquote, create lots of value for the world, which is true in many ways and not true in other ways, but like create lots of value. And then that value can just be like pumped back into the system. And to some yeah. extent, Omidyar is also a function of that where it's like eBay and yeah. like the value gets true, pumped. Yeah. So I don't know. I just, yeah. I, um, 
I will be curious to see how the value. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. There, there's there's a question there, but I don't want to ask it. What I want to ask you is um, this because you were talking about how people in America invest and people in Europe don't invest in stocks as much. And I think yeah. it made me think about something that we, had, we wanted to chat about uh, before the show, which is this like um, movements versus mobs and like yes. oh Wall Street bets and that side of things. How do you think about, um, yeah, creating movements and not mobs? Yeah, I mean, oh God, it's so hard, right? Because ultimately, you know, like the Arab Spring happens and we're cheering it on. Um, uh, you know, K-pop take over, take down Trump and we're cheering it on. <laughs> um, GameStop happens. And originally I'm like, yeah, so cool, activism. And then I think about it, I'm like, oh, so complicated. I don't know, I think, um, I, you know, Obviously, it goes back to like like I just became very aware at a particular point in the GameStop Robin Hood loop that um, exactly the tactics that have been used to make this happen could be used for an outcome that I strongly disliked. You know, like <laughs> I'm, I'm always gonna I'm always gonna be curious about when when the stock um, exchange gets revealed as a massive game because it kind of is that that's something that I think is 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 useful for more people to know about. But yeah, I think it's. I think it's really confusing. And I think we're going to see so many more examples of this kind of swarm behavior online. Um, and, you know, I think, I don't think Robin Hood knew how to deal with it. And that's that's kind of a, you know, a cause for concern because they they didn't have that kind of future planning in place, but they'd raise more money and that's how they dealt with it. Um, you know, Reddit didn't really know how to handle it, but they also raised more money. So really who's kind of winning, you know, it, it's really hard to kind of work out in that particular situation who's winning and who's losing. Because you could argue that it's a bunch of money people on both sides of the table playing a game and it doesn't really have any real world impact until you think about the GameStop employees, um, many of whom, you know, I'm hoping there are employees that have some kind of stock in the company and I'm hoping they cashed out at the right time. But I think I think there's this super weird thing happening where or has has been happening for the last decade or so um, where the Internet behavior is bleeding into real world behavior. And I think this goes back to Eli's nice metaphor around parks you know, you get this kind of, and I've been, I've been part of, and I've nurtured many of these kind of online forum communities in the past, where you get these very strong characters emerge, these collective ideas emerge, a thing takes hold, people get behind it. And it's really unstoppable. And in many ways, it's kind of what happened with Trump, right? It's what happened with the Donald, this, this hilarious idea to start with four or five years ago, or however long there was, <laughs> yeah. like, oh, God, what if this person became president, ends up in a ton of really awful, extractive, ghastly real world outcomes for pretty much everyone that we know. So I think, um, you know, I think it's so like if I was Clubhouse right now, how on earth do you plan ahead for this kind of thing? I'm not yeah, even sure. Oof. It's impossible. I mean, let alone the complexity of audio moderation, but how do you how do you think about swarming? And so I think, you know, I certainly hope Reddit are putting some of their billions or millions, however much they raised, behind really thinking about, you know, they've taken some hard choices in the past. They've banned nude pics. They've banned certain forums. Um, you know, ultimately, Wall Street Bets was working as it was intended. It was a place for people to share Wall Street Bets. They did that. They didn't break the rules, right? At the same time, where, you know, like the next time it happens... What if the target is very different? We don't know. Um, I think there's just so many implications there that I'm still working through. But I think it's, I think it's a story that is um, dangerously fascinating to me in lots of ways. Because uh -huh, I, totally. I, you know, as a community person, I was, I was thinking about how would I have moderated this? Like, how would I have guided my team to moderate this? And I had no idea how I would even got, have got into that conversation with them. Totally, yeah. And I think that it is. Well, so the the, the general note here is that. The well, I guess a couple notes. One is, um, yeah, unlike oh, the winners versus losers. It's like yeah, Wall Street bets um, initially, like the 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 crowd was making money and this is amazing. And but like yeah. if you look at the outcome, it's like tons of people. Obviously, it went back down. You know, GME and you know uh, they uh, one of the hedge funds made seven hundred million dollars off of the trade. So it's like. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's like winners and losers there. And I think also, so I'm currently writing a book um, called Terra Sapien, which is about the rise of our like Borg. And it makes me think of the swarming behavior that you're talking about. Mm. Um, and how, I guess I just want to double click on that for a second. Also, just selfishly to get your take on like um, our rise into a networked organism or whatever. How do you... Yeah. Yeah, like what, um, how should we uh, positively steward this, uh, you know, uh, swarming th thing as it emerges? I mean, that is the million dollar question, right? Like if you think <laughs> about it, if you think about it, when you think about the notion of like a Borg or a tentacled being, all of us already exist in relation to others, right? Like you have your parents, you have your friends, 
Um, some of us have partners or kids or, you know, that we, we exist in context unless you, you know, I think it's very hard to live entirely on your own. Like no man is an island and all that. Um, and I think what's interesting about, you know, for many of us that were on the internet a lot in the 1990s, um, you know who you are. I definitely was one of them. You know, it was the first time that I had online friends. And in many ways, I was able to have conversations online that I couldn't have offline at the time. Like, um, I was able to talk about my sexuality online in a way that I couldn't as a 14 year old girl in a very straight kind of place. Mm. And I think what's interesting is you have to ask what needs are not being met in the real world that kind of, you know, like, I think, I think there's something around healthy living as a whole around like not, not, not in the kind of archaic notions of like wellness and running and stuff. But I think we're living in this time of kind of profound economic crisis. Um, I think a lot of people have jobs that are not meaningful to them. Um, I think there's a massive disconnect between how we live and our government. I think there's just these massive trust gaps everywhere that you look. Um, and I can totally understand why in that context, it's a very seductive idea to have a community online that you go to, whether it's a, a kind of QAnon or a kind of um, Wall Street bets. But I think what's complicated about that is like the platform, and this goes back to a sort of 230 argument, you know, We've seen in the last couple of months, whether it's the Indian farmers standoff that's happening right now in India, obviously with Indian farmers, um, or whether it's Trump, the platforms have the power to act. They have the power to decide what is this place for? Um, and, you know, at the same time, I think in the last year, we've seen loads of places launch like Telepath, um, Somewhere Good, Eternal, you know, places that want to be healthy, positive destinations. They're explicitly saying, come here to feel good. And I feel like we're going to see a lot more of those kind of places bubble up. Um, places that, you know, like for me, Facebook, I go there and it's a lot of school friends and it's just not, it doesn't give me as much value. And that sounds very transactional, but I go to Twitter, I get links for things. Mm -hmm. I you know, like, it's a very, it's a very, it's a place that I can go to and I know what I'm getting. And I personally find a lot of joy in Twitter still, which I know is a controversial take these days. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot more places that actively market themselves as being about come here to feel happy at the same time as we're going to see more places like parlor that are like, okay, come here to do exactly what you want. And part of me thinks, Oh, that's terrible. Um, you know, we need more pluralism. We need to meet people who are not like us. Right. Like I, I think, you know, that's something that I know all of us worry, like I worry about a lot, like I'm in such a bubble at the same time. Part of me thinks it was always a dream to have one space that worked for everybody. It doesn't really work, you know, in the same way that with a park, you know, even in a park, you have the kids playing in the kids area, you have the joggers going around. We're not all together in a park. We're in different places, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, I think that there's a, uh, you have the people who are barbecuing with beers or whatever. Yeah, I think that there's a, I mean, I'm thinking about like the needs thing that you're talking about. I think that that's a crucial piece here, which is that like so much of the internet in the end, like we're just trying to meet human needs. And so it's like, whether it's the folks who are doing LARPing stuff with QAnon and- Yeah, um, to each and, their own. Yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> to each apart their own. Like, apart from when it harms in the real world, to each their own, LARP away. Exactly, exactly. You can LARP on your own time, but don't end up <laughs> having harms in the real world. Um, I also think that that's an important, yeah, like meeting, but yeah, there's this, yeah, and as- it, I just think that um, if we can make, there's like a bunch of small nudges within these platforms that we'll be able to make that will hopefully trend them towards meeting these human needs in a good way. And I don't know. Yeah, I think that there's, um, I, yeah, I, I guess that there's, you're talking about, I agree with like, there's going to be lots of different spaces that do different things. And um, we want them to, I think it's okay to have these kind of consequentialist style things. We're like, look, if, it's, if there are actual harms happening in the real world, that's bad. Um, so that's, I think, a powerful piece of this. Like there's a Borg and then there's all these little micro Borgs that are happening. Yeah. Well, and I think it's, I still believe there's everything to play for, right? The Borg is what you make of it. And the Borg will be co-created by all of us, right? Yeah, exactly. It's not just like something that emerges. And it's like, oops. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Final two questions here in, in, in our final couple minutes. Um, a little overrated, underrated section at the end where I just ask you okay. a thing and you say whether it's overrated, underrated. These are kind of general, but I think they could work. Do you think the negative impacts of social media on society are overrated or underrated? Oh, that's a really hard question. Um, I mean... <laughs> It depends on by whom, right? Like all of these questions depend on what perspective you're looking at it from. I mean, I think I think we so often, when we say social media, we mean Facebook. And I think there are so many more kinds of social media than that. Um, I would say that if we're talking about the broadest strokes of social media, perhaps a little bit overrated, just because I, you know, I can think in the last year, like 
we commissioned some work by Caroline Sanders um, at Mozilla, looking at how people were using community platforms at the start of the pandemic. You know, so we're talking like karaoke parties for their kid in a different country, uh, mutual aid networks. And the biggest thing I took from that project was just the incredible joy in it and the incredible ingenuity of humans. You know, they were basically making it work. Um, and so I think for all of their problems and all of their complexity, you know, if I think back to the 90s and the joy that social media first gave me, I, I still see a lot of value there. Um, and I would argue that perhaps the negative impacts of social media are slightly overrated. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So I think we both, and now it's actually my second question is, are the positive impacts overrated or underrated? And it sounds like we both kind of agree, which is that the negative impacts are a little bit over, like we're all, you both, you and I are like maybe the most aware of all the negative impacts. It's like, oh God, they're like actually really bad, but also it's probably overrated. Like it's not as bad as people say. Yeah. And it's like the positive stuff. Like, can't we like embrace that a little bit more? Cause it's pretty sweet. Yeah. Well, I think we take it for granted, right? I think it's I take it for granted that I can leave my house, press a button, then a taxi turns up where I'll have the driver's license ahead of time. Like, like, you know, I think that's why this conversation is so difficult is we have to hold two very different things in our head at once. You know, I can believe that Uber, Uber gives me incredible convenience at the same time. I think they should pay their drivers a bit more, right? No. Um, but I think, you know, we're now at a position where I've been paying Uber prices for so long, there's going to be a lot of friction involved in me paying them more, right? So I think, I think there's... That's why this work is so hard and so meaningful, I think. Yeah, totally, totally. Uh, okay, well, beautiful. Well, uh, we are at time. But again, thank you for the conversation today, Sarah. And I guess um, for our listeners, do you have any like call to actions or, or things that they should check out either both for Omidyar, but also like what, where are you online? Yeah, I am Sarah Drinkwater on Twitter, which is my preferred medium of choice. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very like, you know, you DM me on Twitter. I'm very open to Twitter um, connection. And I think also like I, you know, I'd love to welcome any proposals, but also if you disagree with me, I would welcome that too. I love um, critique, conversation and challenge. Thank you. Cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, hit up Sarah. I, that, I hit up Sarah just in her, I slid into her DMs and that's how this conversation <laughs> happened. And so you too can slide in there and either critique or say, yo, I got a cool project for you. Uh, well, thanks yeah. again, listeners for coming. And thanks again, Sarah, for being on the show. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Reese. up y'all hope you enjoyed today's episode the i want to do two big points here one on uh, bottom-up communities and one on language the first on communities yes yeah, sarah's talking about how what they're funding now is look you gotta fund the movements you gotta fund the coalitions you gotta fund the networks instead of trying to like talk to zuck himself and go top down you gotta go bottom up you gotta create a uh organized you know worker movement you know or an organized you know builder movement or whatever it might be and that is that makes sense and that also just aligns with so much else of what's happening in society like if you're trying to do a political thing you should probably make it a meme on reddit if you are creating a company or you know doing something like that you should probably go bottom up and you know always be community building or what have you so that all just makes sense to me and is aligned with it's cool that the nonprofit world is also doing the same kind of shared meta pattern or template that other communities are doing. The second piece and possibly more interesting is on language. And I think that it's cool to see Sarah emphasize this and just thinking about some of their investments, really these language ones are crucial. I mean, you know, you know, time well spent is great zebras unite also great you know digital public spaces also great and then the um and so those ones seem just really good to me and i think that there's a i mean i think that it makes me just think about what the new languages should be you know it's like time well spent is a change in metrics instead of saying oh we want engagement it's saying no no, no we want the time to be well spent not poorly spent and so Maybe there are other changes in metrics that we should think about as a society. I think the time well spent one is like the most obvious, but maybe there's something about like bottom up communities and making them movements, not mobs and, and somehow optimizing for that. I guess another thing that's kind of connected to this from a language perspective is like the sh stakeholder versus shareholder economies. 
yeah, it's it's tough to say exactly what uh, what that looks like, but there's a a change in metrics, and I think it's I think it's yeah, moving to a more holistic metric system. I'm just vocal processing out loud here, but I think yeah, I'm not I'm not sure. I'd be curious if any listeners have any thoughts on this because I think what kinds of metrics we want to change. It's mainly this move towards more holistic metrics, value based metrics, and I mean, maybe GDP, you know, that's another example in language changing gross national product versus, you know, gross national happiness. That's the, uh, I think the, not Burma and Myanmar, but um, the place that I am forgetting the name of right now, near Nepal, Bhutan. Thank you. Um, yeah. So Bhutan does, you know, national happiness. So those are, those experiments are interesting. I think the change in metrics and the change in language that results from the change in metrics is very important and juicy. The second one is like zebras unite. That's all about saying, no, 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 we're not trying to go look for unicorns here. We're looking for zebras, which are multifaceted and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I think, and they actually exist in the real world. And what that does is it takes an existing metaphor, an existing kind of goal, and reframes it. And so I'm not sure the other goals that could exist like that, the other metaphors that are powerful, like, ah, the goal is blah 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 you know maybe it's like the um, american dream is a metaphor that currently exists and that people are you know trying to achieve and maybe there's some kind of american meme or you know Amer- some other th- version of reality that is like oh this is actually what we should be going for as a society uh, so i guess that one is a you know thinking from a template perspective it's a change in um a change in metaphors on, on the goal and then the final one there's digital public space and saying oh let's instead like is facebook a digital public space no it ain't you know it's just like it's a feed um and so what could it look like if it was more like a park you know and even that one's a good like feed versus park is a good example so i'm not sure i think that that one's one where you're taking you're mapping the existing world onto the digital world um, some other ones in the space are stuff like ownership economy, doing blank economy is like a classic, like, oh, we're trying to make a, a movement around this new idea that we're spearheading. So, uh, yeah, I think those experiments in language are very powerful and very necessary and are a weird source of a surprising amount of impact in society. Great. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and goodbye.